what's up y'all so this is the thing on instagram you know y'all shout out to everybody that follows me on instagram we've been having a good time lately we have been live streaming y'all attended a concert of mothers it's just been fun um another thing that happened on instagram is these people didn't straight sent me out okay i was scrolling through my old photos in my phone and i came across this one right here it was actually on my explore page back in i think 2019 and i screenshot it and i was like it's so beautiful i want to be able to do this look one day it's so beautiful shout out to raquel because when i went to find her page i found out this was following me so i had to follow her back and i'm just like maybe there's a sign that i should try it so i reposted it to my story and all of the girls have sent me out which brought me here today to try to recreate this look and mother is scared, okay? But they gassed me up saying I can do it or whatever. Maybe I can because when I was looking through my palettes, which I have way too many of, I realized today, I was like, which which palette has these colors? And then I was like, oh, the Jackie Ina palette has it. Child, then I went back and actually read the freaking caption and she clear as day said that this is the one she used. So I'm feeling a little bit encouraged, like, I might have it, but you know what? If I can't pull it off and I actually have the actual palettes used, use, I'm gonna really be looking dumb. So let's just get into it. Let's try, let's see. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, you kind of got the tea about what today's video is about. The quote I posted about homie eating the real egg, we go in there today. And if you don't know, my Instagram handle is Glamazon Vaughn. It was Glamazon God, short for Glamazon Goddess, but they wouldn't let me put all that in the username. So I was like, you know what? I just don't like the way Glamazon God looks or sounds so i changed the bond the geese are really quiet right now but they were really putting on the show this morning and when i took blue on the walk i saw that them bitches had had puppies okay they had puppies running all around the water i said oh my god it's more of them all right so today's video is about arthur shawcross arthur shawcross was born on june the 6th 1945 he was the first of four children he was originally born in kittery maine but when he was very young his parents relocated the family to new york so maine people new york people these your folks cutting up like this arthur is also a gemini he was a very very unhappy child and a frequent bedwetter now according to him this was a result of his mother touching him inappropriately for years throughout his childhood now, according to him she would also do really really disturbing things like take household items and probe him with them pretty disturbing things the first couple of years of his school life he did really really well like the first two years of school he was exceptional a's and b's but after the third year things just pretty much started to plummet which i think that's when you really start doing work those a's and b's in the first two years they really don't mean anything they gave little arthur an iq test which he scored a mere 86 on which is extremely low so i guess when they went from coloring to actual questions he started to struggle by the time he reached middle school, he was very much a bully. He began to act out a lot. He was, of course, still struggling with his schoolwork. And during this time, he also began an inappropriate relationship with his sister. It's unclear of which one of them initiated it. Given the fact that he was a lot bigger and he was the older sibling, I don't know. It's just my own assumption that it was him, but I don't know. So don't take that as fact. Now, when his mother found out about this, this relationship or that it had happened however many times that it did she was very very upset about it which is odd considering what she had allegedly done to him but okay at that point it actually stopped but from there he just went on to start experimenting with animals he had a lot going on in his little life really early on since so hit the ground running in the wrong damn direction by the time he reached high school he was significantly larger than all the other kids and he was still very much a bully. Sis was rude. He would lash out violently at the other kids, at the staff. And when he did not pass the ninth grade and they told him he had to repeat it, he pretty much refused. He was like, I will drop out before I repeat this grade. And so that's what he does. At 15 years old, he drops out of high school. A few years later, he meets and marries a woman with whom he has a son. Instead of this inspiring him to settle down and be a good man, husband, and father, honey, he just continues with the mess. He began to get in a lot of trouble with the law for various offenses, whether it was like bully related, he had some breaking and entering charges. He had some vandalism and some arts and charges. And after a couple of probationary sentences, his wife, she decided to just divorce him. She was not into any of the things, child. She said, no, ma'am. He actually gave up his parental rights to their son, who was 18 months at the time, 
and never saw him again. In 1967, he ends up getting drafted into the U.S. Army to serve one tour over in Vietnam. When he returned, he would brag about all of these grotesque things that he had to do over there in combat. And it wasn't like he was disturbed by these things. He was bragging as if he actually enjoyed doing these things. Although in actuality, Sis had never even served active combat. So he was just a liar. After serving his one year, he returns to New York. He marries his second wife, Linda. And although he was he was pretty open about how shitty of a human being he was, Linda got a chance to see just how horrible and dark certain aspects of his personality or his characteristics were. One of the first things that she noticed that really made her feel away was the fact that not only did sis like to set fires he got like this sexual gratification with lighting things on fire how is that eternal you know i don't like to shame people for what they into as long as you know it's not hurting nobody i just that one is beyond me i don't get that one she actually stuck with him throughout two of his little prison sentences one time he went to jail for five years the other time he got 22 months and he had gone to jail for arson and burglary after that second time sis got like me she was like you know what this is too much i'm not about to remain in this relationship if you're gonna remain in jail this isn't this isn't gonna work linda makes the decision to just leave him alone altogether she files for divorce and she leaves arthur but one thing about an sk they gonna find love it did not take him long at all to find and secure wife number three and what he also done during this time is horrible so i'm gonna glaze over this real quick because y'all know how i feel and a lot of y'all feel the same way a 10 year old boy by the name of jack from the neighborhood. He had taken him fishing on April 7th, 1972. And after that fishing trip, Jack was never seen or heard from again. They cannot prove that he had done anything to Jack. So he essentially gets away with it. And just three weeks later, he and Linda get married. And Linda is currently pregnant with his child. Just eight months later, he strikes again, this time victimizing a 10-year-old girl. Now, luckily, in this instance, there was a witness that came forward and said that they had actually seen him with the young girl right before she went missing. And so they arrested him the very next day for this. You know what's really, really messed up? They actually allow him to plead guilty to a lesser charge of just manslaughter for both of the children's cases. And as a result, he is only sentenced to 25 years in jail. He only serves out 14 of those years after it is concluded by the prison staff and social workers that he is no longer dangerous. Did y'all bring some children in there to see? Like, I'm just trying to understand how you come up with that conclusion. <laughs> Raquel, I'm trying, girl. What's even more crazy is the fact that a whole real actual psychiatrists had evaluated him and gave their professional input that he was a whole schizoid psychopath uh, against the doctor's recommendation that he stay stay put and in jail they just go ahead and release him anyway insane however it is not surprising he is released on parole in april of 1987 now, in the midst of all of this, of course, wife number three had packed her things and left him. And due to all the public outrage and them rioting and tearing down the streets as they should have, in response to him being released so early, he is forced to relocate. The judicial system that was designed with him in mind, child, does him a solid in order to prevent chaos and panic and discrimination wherever he moved. They decide to seal his record, making it inaccessible to even other police departments. Like nobody could view this record and see that his past was, was this terrible. And when pressed for a reason, as to why they felt like that was a good idea and why they would release him early to the unsuspecting Rochester community, the board of parole simply said, we had to put him somewhere. But girl, put him back in jail, girl. That's where he was. And so he arrives in Rochester with a new leash on life, a whole second chance, and secures wife number four. Roughly 10 months later, on March 24th, 1988, it's a group of hunters that are out walking alongside Salmon Creek. The weather had just broken from a long cold winter and so the lake itself was mostly covered in ice still. It was beginning to melt though, so some of the ice had broken in some places. The hunters are just walking alongside the river, having conversation when all of a sudden they spot what they initially believed to be a mannequin inside the water. But as they get closer, they soon realize 
but it is not a mannequin at all. It is actually a very real woman. A woman wearing jeans and a sweatshirt and she is slashed across the face. They immediately call authorities and the woman is identified as 27 year old Dorothy. Dorothy had been reported missing just a couple of days before by her sister. The sister was watching her children and she knew that Dorothy had some issues she had struggled with addiction and she also was into sex work and so she feared that something might have happened to her because she had not heard from her in days and it was not like her to just go missing for this long. They retrieve her from the water and they notice that she is covered in bruises and not only that she had a bunch of bite marks around her private area. There was no water in her lungs which proved to them that she was tossed into the river post-mortem. Once investigators did a little digging into who she was and the kind of work she was into, they pretty much conclude that she lived a dangerous lifestyle and with said lifestyle that these kind of things were not bound to happen, but it wasn't surprising and pretty much that it was a known risk. And so she was not on their top list of priorities. Now, the following year of 1989, around the fall time, bodies of women who shared a similar lifestyle to Dorothy, they began popping up all over the place. And although they share a similar background and lifestyle, the crime themselves have few similarities. The MO varied some and the method of disposal varied a lot. So police did not believe that the same person was responsible for everything. In September of 89, a man is walking and he sees bones sticking up out of the ground. He calls the police immediately. They come out and investigate, but with what little evidence that they had, they were unable to make a positive identification. They decide to reference the missing persons list and there were over 130 people that this could have possibly been. And so that didn't help them at all. At this point, they decide to solicit the help of a forensic specialist. This forensic specialist comes in to recreate the victim's appearance to try to then put out a, you know, a sketch of what the person looked like, a composite sketch, which is insane because they literally just had mostly skull, but... I guess that's why they're a specialist child. And this actually works because a man comes forward and is able to identify the person as his 28-year-old daughter. And once they had the name, they were able to further identify her by dental records. Anna, she had a sordid past that pretty much mimicked Dorothy's. Now, unfortunately, because of the condition that they found her in, they're only able to make an educated guess as to what her COD might have been. And because of the circumstances and the details of the crime child, they don't even make any kind of correlation or link between her and Dorothy at all. They think that this is the work of two separate people. Six weeks later, another group of hunters are walking alongside the Genesee River when they make another grisly discovery of yet another woman that has been dumped in the river. This time, the person had obviously attempted to hide the woman. Although she was in the water, she was like tucked behind these tall weeds. And so you really could have missed her if you were just walking by not paying attention. Of course, they alert the authorities who come out and retrieve her from the water and her COD was determined to be blunt force trauma and she also had a broken neck. They were not able to identify her, but the news did spread about the discovery. And when this happened, a man comes forward and he reports that there was this homeless woman that he was used to seeing around that he had not seen in a while. Police decide to go forward and investigate this tip and that leads them to be able to positively identify her as 59-year-old Dorothy Keeler. Now, just six days after this discovery, a young boy is outside playing, minding his business, when he spots a foot sticking out of this pile of trash near the local YMCA. It is that of 25-year-old Patty Eves, who was also into sex work. I can't talk while I'm doing this. Hold on. This pink liner is too light, so let's just deepen her up with the pink in the palette that I'm sure she used. Finally, after four gruesome discoveries within such a short time period, police were realizing, you know, maybe we got a maybe we got a hunter on our hands of different sorts. Maybe this is the work of one person. Because clearly we can't have just four deranged people out here running these Rochester streets. At this point, they decide to go back and take a second look for similarities between all four crime scenes that they may have missed beforehand. And this is what they come up with. All four of the women have been partially concealed. At least three of the four women has suffered some level of asphyxiation. None of the women showed any sign of struggle, which also leads them to believe that whoever it was was quick, 
efficient and most likely very strong. Now who he was, they had no clue, but they felt confident in that little bit of information. Sis told me I could do this look while smoking a cigarette with the smoke getting in my eyes, but I don't feel that confident. I don't know where this is gonna end up. Low key, as stressful as this is, like, I'm really giving sadist teas because I'm kind of enjoying it. Because all of these women shared a similar background and they all did the same kind of work, they decided to go out and interview the women who worked in the same district, if they had seen anything strange going on or if there was somebody that had been unnecessarily rough with them because that could potentially be their guy. Now, of course, that don't go as, as smoothly as they had planned. That's like walking up to a, a trap house asking the dealer, hey, has any of your customers, your clients been particularly rude lately? Like, girl, what am I supposed to say? Yeah, I'm gonna be like, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. This my this my grandma house and we bake cookies over here. Like, no. Of course the girls were very much skeptical and they were not trying to give no information to the police, none whatsoever. They did not trust the police. They just knew that this was a ploy to set them up. So none of them were too quick to, to give any kind of information out. Police had to actually gain their trust by laying off the arrest. After a while, when they were letting the girls slide and do their thing in the dark without being disturbed, they start to feel like, you know what? Maybe maybe they're not trying to trick us a lot of them were still very leery even some of the ones that came forward to give information because there was one lady who had a john who was particularly rough with her she said that during the night he just randomly became really aggressive he'd also made mention of the girls that had been discovered and then he made a motion toward her with his hands like he was trying to put them around her neck and she was like oh no i'm not playing that little reindeer game sis pulled out a whole blade on him and was like you better back up because i ain't the one or the two and i damn sure ain't about to be number five okay at least that's what i would have said i guess she knew this guy by the name mitch but they all pretty much figured that that was most likely a fake name that he just used. She also said that he drove a gray van. Almost forgot this. So when she pulled the blade out and went toward him, she said he wasn't even scared. He seemed to be turned on by the whole thing. And she was like, sir, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you and it's gonna hurt. Why are you liking this? They decide that if he frequented the girls, that he probably would be back. So it's best for them to just set up a little sting operation and wait. They get them a little unmarked car, they put on them some plain clothes, and they just, they park it and they wait. Looking for this gray van to pull up any minute. Now, despite all of their efforts, women continue to disappear, like right underneath their nose. Within just two weeks of each other, 30-year-old June Stott and 22-year-old Marie Welch both are reported missing. Now, June, she was not one of the working girls. She actually had a history of like mental health troubles. Furthermore, June had gone off before without telling anybody and disappeared and then just returned later. Her boyfriend, he goes to the police to express his concerns, report her missing, and just let them know that he is afraid that she might be next with all of this going on. But because she was not one of the working girls it's her boyfriend that is very highly unlikely that she is at risk and so he should just go home and wait for her to return and they don't look into her disappearance at all right after this 22 year old Frances brown she is reported missing on november 11th 1989 and just four days later she is found discarded down a slope alongside the Genesee River. The very same day that she is discovered, which is November 15th, 30 year old Kimberly Logan is also discovered. And the police were genuinely perplexed, allegedly, as to how their guy was striking right underneath their nose. Like they were like, girl, we've been sitting out here for, for weeks. Now I like these lashes, I do but they're not dramatic enough for me today. So I'm about to change them. We're just gonna peel these bad girls right on off. I know somebody is cringing at me snatching my lashes off like so, but girl, they've been through worse, trust me. Eight days go by, just eight, and yet another woman is discovered, partially concealed and discarded in a swampy area, but this woman was a little different because she'd endured a hell of a lot more brutality than the previous women. This amount of rage had not been taken out on any of the previous women. They'd also left behind a towel and the knife, but there were no fingerprints on the knife whatsoever. So I guess they used a little towel to clean it. This woman is identified as June Stott, the woman whose boyfriend had reported her and the police pretty much were like, oh no, she's not his type. She's not at risk. Idiots. 
asphyxiation partially concealed and discarded just a couple miles away from where the previous women had been it was pretty obvious that this was the work of their guy the rochester police department they were obviously very ill-equipped to handle this case and they were becoming increasingly both embarrassed and frustrated so at this point they decided to solicit the help of the fbi they were like you know what we thought we could but we couldn't the fbi they agree to help and they also call on the state police to assist but before they can all assemble and sit around the table and discuss the details and come up with a plan of action another discovery is made on Thanksgiving Day, just four days after the previous discovery. Yet another hunter is out minding his business when he stumbles upon a woman. And this time it is 29 year old Elizabeth Gibson. Now everything about this crime itself mirrored the ones before it, except with this one, there was a witness. You see, Elizabeth was one of the working girls and Joanne, the lady who previously told the story about how Mitch had got rough with her and she had to threaten and shank him and he was actually excited about it. She had actually seen Elizabeth getting into that same gray vehicle. Up until this point, she wasn't completely convinced that Mitch was actually the one out here doing this to this woman because he didn't do it to her. She had just mentioned to the police what had happened when she was asked if anybody had been particularly rough with her lately. But when she hears about what happened to Elizabeth and the state in which she was discovered, she knew that he had to be it. So she goes back to the police and she's like, hey, it has to be him. It has to be the same guy. Police finally felt like they had a solid lead now. So the Avengers, they assemble, honey. The local police, state police, and the FBI, and they put their little heads together and they think. They sit down together, they go over the details of now all 12 cases. They're looking for any kind of patterns or anything that can help them form some kind of profile for the person that they're looking for and child this is what they come up with okay they said that he had to be white and he had to be a man that is from the area like a local man that actually lives there who was familiar with the city and the river they also conclude that he has to be in his late 20s to early 30s sis more than likely had a wife or at least a long time girlfriend and worked an ordinary job he drove an unmemorable vehicle one that just really didn't catch your attention at all, which y'all already knew he drove that great van, so y'all had that one. That was a given. They also said that he had to be somebody who was just so plain that he blended in seamlessly with everybody in the town, like nothing special about him, nothing alarming. He would appear to be very nice and just the average harmless guy. The unusual suspect, one who was invisible in plain sight to both the police and the women that were in danger he would present no threat he would also have to be one that was extremely cunning and confident because he was able to use his environment to his advantage like he knew that was an advantage of his and child he just he just felt like he was that girl he is also believed to have a history of crimes in the sexual nature so they pretty much feel like he could be anybody at all at this point like he could be any of the local town men which is kind of disturbing when you think about it like that's what y'all dealing with in, in new york that's that's the typical man in rochester like i'm trying to see and if so i'm concerned the fbi pretty much just put together this profile handed it to the police and was like look 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 for this person right here like we pretty much didn't let you know exactly who you're looking for find them so given this information the police come up with this brilliant idea local police state police they put their heads together they come up with them extraordinary plan right they go to a local bar owner and they tell him to host a raffle giving away a large tv and submit the names of every man who signed up to win that tv because that would be their list of potential suspects <sighs> and they felt confident that this meant something because this would be men who frequented the area child that's just me and who like to go to the bar and who would like a free tv child my name would have been on the raffle unless you just had to be a man to sign up which i doubt baby if you just wanted the fbi to turn their little plane around and come back just say that nevertheless they were confident in this plan they felt like it was brilliant from the list they decided to grab up this 38 year old man who drove a gray van and they're pretty much accusing him he is their prime suspect until he comes back with a solid alibi from his employer because he had some job where he had to travel a lot and almost every instance he was out of town his job verified it so 
they had to let him go because it obviously was not him. They had to go back to the drawing board and they really don't come up with any other plan. Like they don't know what else to do. Meanwhile, women continue to go missing. On December 31st of 1989, a pair of black jeans are found like frozen near the lake that is also partially frozen. Inside the jeans was an ID belonging to 19 year old Felicia Stevens. They continue to search the area looking for just anything else. Not far from the pants, they actually find a pair of her boots. Now there is no sign of Felicia herself, but they do believe that she will be found and probably would be the next victim of their guy. When their search down on the ground on foot doesn't yield any type of results, they decide to do an aerial search of the area, which was actually pretty difficult considering that there was a lot of snow on the ground. So they're like, we up here in this helicopter, we already up a little high. And then you have the snow on the ground potentially covering up what we're looking for. But nonetheless, they decide to just to just make an attempt anyway. Like what could it hurt at this point? After two whole days of them scouring the area in this helicopter and not really finding anything, they got a little discouraged with their lack of progress, but they decided not to quit. Just give one more little roundabout search of the area. We just gonna make one more circle around the block before we give up. They decided to take their final sweep over the area that they had found the first woman. It doesn't take them long at all to spot what appears to be a woman. She is lying face down and spread eagle on top of the ice near a bridge. They immediately go down to hover a little closer to get a better view and when they do that they see a Chevy celebrity and there is a large man right outside the car that appeared to be to be urinating right there on the ground, no class. Now authorities up in the helicopter, they radio for the little boots on the ground to immediately get out here and get to this man. But before they can actually make it out there, he zips up his little pants, gets back in his car and he is out of there. Meanwhile, they work on getting the woman off of the ice and identified and she is 33 year old June Cicero who had been reported missing two weeks prior. Now Sis might've gotten away from the cars on the ground, but the helicopter was still following him, keeping an eye on him, surveilling him from up above. So of course they were able to keep an eye on him and got their little four wheel brethren down on the ground right to where this car was headed. He makes a stop somewhere and when he does, they immediately approach his vehicle and demand that he provide some kind of identification. He did not have a driver's license at all, but he identifies himself as 44 year old Arthur Shawcross. At this point, police are very much confident that they have caught their guy and that he had pretty much just been either called red-handed, dropping her there, or he was just returning to the scene of the crime for his own little sadistic pleasures. Whatever the case, they knew that Arthur had to be the one responsible. State police come in to assist with the interrogation because you know they can't really trust the locals. They didn't want them to fumble the ball at this point. So they, they was like, no, nah, girl. We'll come in and interrogate. We'll do the questioning. You just you just fill out the paperwork, sis. We got this. Bars. They went right in and told him that this is what we think you did. We know this was you. Immediately, he denies it. He's like, that ain't me. I didn't do it. They bring up the fact that there was an eyewitness who had seen him with Elizabeth the day before she had gone missing. He denies that too. He's like, mm-mm, must have been a coincidence. I'm not responsible for what happened to her. Like, that wasn't me. When asked about the woman that they had just found when they picked him up, he said that it was a sheer coincidence. He had stopped in the area to take a little whiz and he didn't even know she was there. He hadn't seen her. After being interrogated for a while, he brings up a woman by the name of Clara Neal, but he is asking about her to speak with her and he is expressing a little concern. They can tell by his tone and his body language, this is somebody that he has some sort of emotional connection to, relationship with, and so maybe they can use this as leverage. Furthermore, they had run their vehicle registration on the car that they pulled him in and it belonged to this Clara Neal. They began to question him about Clara's involvement in all of this. They're like, is she responsible? Was she helping you? Was she responsible for the lady that you just dropped off? Like, maybe we should go pick up Miss Clara. This actually works because he just responds, no, Clara is not involved. So just 28 minutes into his interrogation, Sis begins to crack. He starts to tell them everything. He first begins with Elizabeth and tells them what he had done to her. He claims that he had done so in self-defense. She had attacked him first. 
because he had picked her up, solicited her services. He claimed that during oral, she bit him and that pretty much justified what he had done to her after the fact. From there, the floodgates open and he provides a ton of detail about all of the crimes that they were working to solve. He even asked for a map and pictures of the victims to help him accurately paint the picture of what he had done. This actually led them to find two more women that they had not yet discovered. There was a woman by the name of Darlene and another woman by the name of Marie, both of whom had previously been reported missing. And when all was said and done and he finished, his confession was 79 pages long. 79. He couldn't afford a lawyer, so he was given a public defender who at the arraignment submitted a plea of innocence. This plea was only to set the groundwork for his later defense strategy, which is insanity. See, Miss Arthur got up there and claimed to have had PTSD from that year that he spent over in Vietnam. The prosecution, they were not playing with him at all. They brought in military personnel, honey, to challenge the validity of that. And that's exactly what they did. They were like, dog, sis is lying. Ain't no way. Now, once he was exposed for being a fraud about his whole military experience, they quickly abandoned their whole PTSD thing. They were like, you know what? Scratch that. Next, they hire a doctor to evaluate Arthur to prove that he is in fact insane. They spend a lot of money on this doctor to do their own private evaluation, only to have the doctor turn around and say that he is actually very deceptive. He is very much sane, that he may be a sociopath, but he is not insane. They flat out asked this doctor to certify him as insane. Just get up there and say he is anyway. And he was like, no, I refuse to do so. There is literally no evidence that supports this theory. He's very much sane. From there, his lawyer just decided to move on to a different doctor. He solicits the help of another psychiatrist, Dr. Lewis, for a similar assessment of Arthur. And this woman spends time with Arthur and she comes up with an assessment that is completely the opposite of the first doctor. Go figure. Now she claims that he showed signs of a number of disorders, including dissociative identity disorder, where it could have been somebody else's child. Patricia could have checked in and committed these crimes and he could have not known anything about them. She said that it was triggered by his childhood trauma. Sis also sprinkled a little brain abnormality right on top. Say he had a cyst on his frontal lobe and that also has something to do with it. Child was everybody but him. It was the other personality, it was the cyst. Everybody but sis. He tells this doctor a number of wild stories about things that happened to him in his childhood. It wasn't just his mama, it was his auntie too. They reached out to the family. The family was like, no, his auntie never did any of these things. His mother actually was contacted and she said that she didn't understand why he would make up such a thing because she said she had never done any of these things to him in his childhood. And the family pretty much stuck by her and said it never happened. So, whether or not it did or it didn't, the family just said no, he made that up. Arthur also told Dr. Lewis stories of him consuming some of the women. Quote, I took the right leg off that woman's body from the knee to the hip, took the fat off and ate it while I stared at the other girl. When I bit into it, she just urinated right there. He also confused a lot of the details between the crimes, mixing them up, which he did not do when he initially spoke to police. And instead of Dr. Lewis taking that as a sign that he was up to something or that he might be lying, she just contributed to him being confused due to his diminished mental capacity. Whether or not she truly believed in what he was saying and what she reported as her findings or if sis accepted a bribe from them, we don't know, but it backfired because everybody was looking at her crazy. They felt like she was being played like a fool, honey, by a fool. It was a, not a good look for her at all. The prosecution had a field day with this. They highlighted her as a gullible, unprepared idiot, pretty much. And so the defense was pretty much back to square one again with no defense strategy that was sticking. Everything that they presented to support their insanity plea pretty much got debunked and fell through the cracks. The courts did allow the evidence of the frontal lobe cyst to be admitted into court, but the prosecution tore that down immediately. They brought in a doctor, a neurologist, who confirmed that its effects as it pertains to his actions and what he's done is pretty much insignificant. According to him, it would be straight up ridiculous to believe that this will cause him 
to do any of these things. Like, no. The jury does not take long to deliberate at all. They come back and they say that they pretty much believe that sis is completely sane and therefore should be held fully accountable. He is giving a whopping 250 years that he would have to serve all 250 years before he would be eligible for parole. And then he received a life sentence on top of that. Now, Clara Neal, who was his longtime girlfriend through all of this, decides that she is going to stick by her man's side. She actually marries him in a prison ceremony. Child. Sis said she was going to wait for him. Wait 250 years. She a better woman than me because you know I ain't waiting 250 days. Said it before and I say it again. You go to jail longer than the weekend, baby. Now, unfortunately for Miss Lil' Clara, he barely put a dent in that 250 years, okay? He died in 2008 at the age of 66. And that is pretty much it for this story and this video. Let me let y'all know this ahead of time so y'all not surprised. Even though somebody's still gonna miss the memo because they've already clicked off this video. You're gonna get this video today. You're gonna get a video on Thursday of this week. And you will also get a video on April 27th next Tuesday. But mother is going on vacation because my mom's birthday is on mother's day this year and you know y'all my girls but that's my og that's my old girl and so she turned like 106 for this year to celebrate i am taking that girl on vacation i'm taking her her sisters her two sisters my two sisters and a couple of her friends she loves the beach i got us a little spot on the beach child for her to enjoy herself and her favorite people we're leaving out on wednesday april 28th and we won't be back until sunday so i won't be back up on him until may 6th so next week there will be no thursday video and the week after that there will not be a tuesday video but there will be a thursday video so i just wanted to give y'all a heads up because mother is gonna be out enjoying life but both weeks y'all get one upload instead of two so it ain't like i'm just completely abandoning my loves i'm really excited y'all i'm excited but my mama is child she's stressing me a little bit she's like i don't want you spending all your money i plan on paying for everything for her for the trip and she is y'all been on using a little stash of money she's been putting aside for her vacation i'm honestly gonna be a little bit sad when this is over because i really enjoyed the planning of the trip up until this point like I feel like I'm going to enjoy hosting it. I'm putting together a brunch. I'm just enjoying all of the things that have gone into planning this trip. Like, it makes me want to plan one for myself for my birthday in November. I just might. I'm excited. I'm not vlogging the trip. I was on Instagram Live the other night, and y'all were like, vlog the trip. I ain't doing that, girl. I want to just go and have fun and not be lugging a camera around. But I will go live with y'all on Instagram. So y'all can go over there and add me on there if you want to see some of it. You want to see the trip? That's where it'll be. I encourage y'all to follow me over there anyway. It's a whole vibe. We be having fun over there. Some of us too much fun. Yes, you, my girl. You know who y'all. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. Don't forget to like the video, share the video with a friend or a foe, girl, share it with somebody. Hit the subscribe button if you are currently lurking and you are not a part of the family. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Peace. So I changed it to Vaughn. Hold on, why wouldn't they let me put it? V-A-U-G-H-E-N, that's six letters. G-O-D-D-E-S-S, -S, seven. Girl, y'all could've let me have the extra S. Instagram, love to try it. One more character would not have hurt y'all. Damn, my forehead is big. It's only four fingers though, so I don't know if it's technically considered big or not. Looks big. Looks very Doja Cat-ish. No shade, I love Doja. Cat. Genesee River Killer, I think. That's what they call that girl. Arthur Shawcross was born on, what the fuck was his birthday? From there, he went on to experience, experience, this experiment, baby girl. A few years later, he meets and marries a woman by the name, okay, I don't know her name. A few years later, he meets and he marries, oh no, I used the wrong brown. Oh girl, this is already going to hell. Fuck it. You have not been truly stressed out until you've had to match tape. Excuse me, Miss Mamas. You can chirp somewhere else, my girl. I love the animals, but they obviously don't give a damn about me. I can't film it quiet for nothing. Certified schizoid par... I was going to say paranoid. That he was a whole schizoid sight... Sight... Against the... 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 the, the Stuttering Stanley, that's me. The do three young children and her sister was watching her for them. Watching her for them, that's not right. 
The crimes themselves have few similarities. Similarities, girl, I know you in there. The help of a sur syringic girl. Jesus. At this point, they decide to solicit the help of a syringic. Why do I keep saying syringic? Jesus, take the wheel. Six weeks, six weeks or months. When they make another grizzly discover. E. They go forward and uh, investigate girl. Girl, you really doing a lot on the little tree. Please relax. Finally, after four gruesome discoveries within such shirtshire, three of the four women had suffered from ex. ex <sighs> oh shit, I got a whole nother eye over here. I thought I was done with this liner. Just to realize I got two eyes. Oh my god, blue sweet potatoes in the oven. It didn't burn. I had it wrapped in full. The bottom is a little. Probably a little burnt, a little extra sticky. I'm just gonna tell him it's caramelized, girl. He ain't gonna know. He won't know the difference. Asked if anybody had been rough. Yeah. He was also believed to have had, where is my brush? Does he have that? You know, we're up here in this helicopter. Helicopter, where's the H? Just been called ran, ran handed. Girl, what's that? The woman that they, okay. You're stuttering again. They quickly abandoned that whole PTSD thing. Yeah. They flat out asked him to certify him as his nah. dissociative identity disorder. Disorder. Did I say disorder? Now whether no no what? Girl, the fire department. I'm so nosy. What's going on? You know the firefighters be kind of fine, but not these. Did I do an intro? I don't recall doing the intro. Yeah, well, we here now, baby. It's the end. Yes, hair. I can't wait to take you to the beach and dip you in the ocean. We ain't going too far, cause I'd be damned if the jellyfish get me again.